Okay, good. So, um, I just wanted to mention, so where have we seen things that are consistent with chiral or nematic superconductivity? So uh, this is perhaps the most, one of the most known, is a strontium ruthenate. PC is about 1.5 Kelvin, and there is very strong evidence that it breaks time reversal symmetry. Usually to see that, you, these are two of the measurements that you rely the most. Kerr effect, it's an optical measurement that essentially tells you whether time whether there is a magnetic moment in the system, and this is the Kerr signal on setting below TC. There's also mu SR, which is mu on spin rotation, which uh, as you can see here, also sees a signature below uh, uh, TC. There's still lots of questions about what's the pairing state. In the beginning, people thought it was P plus IP. Nowadays, it's clearly, or it's very unlikely that it is a, a triplet, so it's an open question of what it is. Uh, this was uh, discussed by Nick in his talk, the uranium tellurium 2 is a much more recent uh, 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 experiment. This is an orthorhombic system. And again, you see here time reversal symmetry uh, by Kerr effect. As you can see here, this delta theta k. If there is a Kerr angle, it means that it uh, breaks time reversal. But uh, there are groups, the groups, uh, my understanding is that the data is consistent, but the interpretation is different, okay? And uh, as also Nick showed, that under pressure, there's evidence of two superconducting transitions, which would be consistent of uh, having something that can break time reversal. Uh, this is, a, again, a recent material. This is a potassium uh, vanadate 3 antimony 5. This is uh, the family of Kagome metals that are superconductors. So this is the Kagome lattice. And this is the first, as far as I know, Kagome superconductor. And this usually has a charge density wave that coexists with superconductivity. But if you apply pressure, you can actually, this, this line here is the, uh, is, the, is the charge density wave transition. You can kill it. And then you can do mu SR, mu and spin rotation, with, uh, um, as a function of temperature, away from at finite pressures. And you see a, an onset here that hints that it could be breaking time reversal symmetry. Uh, this uh, twisted uh, cuprate, and uh, I, I know that Marcel is gonna tell more, much more about it in his talk, but the idea is that you take two monolayer cuprates, rotate them by 45 degrees, and uh, I think now, uh, this is an older slide, there's a new version of the paper, there is very good evidence that this breaks time reversal symmetry. I'm sure Marcel is gonna cover that uh, in his lecture. Oh, these are all chiral superconductors. What about the match? Yes. So, how do you get from the effect of the effect of the yeah, yeah, mu SR is a, is, is a tricky measurement. Uh, but so, what they do essentially, and this is my understanding so, uh, mu one, uh, you implant a mu one on, on a sample, and, uh, and then it decays, right? And you measure essentially the asymmetry in the decay. So, in the presence of a magnetic field, right, this mu is gonna uh, process and that's gonna be uh, manifested. There's gonna be a fingerprint in the, in the asymmetry that you measure. So there's always a decay rate and, and from that decay rate, so this delta gamma here is, the, is this decay rate. Now there's several steps here because there's a decay rate because of the nuclei, there's because of the electrons and um, to see really long range magnetism you'd see oscillations, which they don't see. They see a decay, but they see a change in the relaxation rate as function of temperature, okay? There are only very few lab, uh, few um, facilities that can do that. Okay, now how do you look, so Kerr and mu SR are two of the main techniques they use to look for that. Uh, for pneumatic superconductivity, the main, the, the main manifestation that people have looked at is to look at the ma critical magnetic field as function of the angle. And if you see that it's twofold uh, symmetric, that's a signature that you broke time over uh, pneumatic. Now, uh, there's a very known trivial statement, and I'm not gonna go into details, but because HC2 is when you are killing the, 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 the superconducting state, there's no, it's not obvious why it would be two-fold symmetric if it's a pneumatic superconductor, but there are ways where we believe we understand that related to a vestigial phase or to 
uh, uh, fluctuations coupling to a residual strain. But anyway, this is a signature that there can be something happening. Doped bismuth selenide is perhaps the most, uh, uh, where the evidence is the strongest, I would say, is a trigonal material, okay? Meaning it's kind of hexagonal, but not really. And you see lots of different experiments that see this uh, two-fold anisotropy in HC2, okay? Um, more recently, few layer niobium diselenide. Niobium diselenide is a, just a, uh, in bulk is just a conventional superconductor. In few layer, it has uh, some different properties. And two different groups found that you see again these two-fold oscillations of the magnetic resistance or of the, of the critical field. Um, whether this is re related to an emetic ground state or to something else remains uh, unclear. Twisted bilayer graphene, this is data uh, from the group of Pablo Lejero, uh, Lejero sorry, <laughs> uh, hexagonal uh, symmetry. And you see very nicely, again, the two-fold symmetry. This is twisted bilayer on uh, whole doped only, okay? Um, so, or in the whole doped side of the, of the phase argumentation. And again, this is very strong evidence, or there is, this is evidence that you, you can have two-fold rotational symmetry breaking. Uh, let me see. Uh, before I move on, I think there's an important thing and, uh, uh, to mention is that when you see this, you say, oh, there could be nematic superconductivity. But there are, there are lots of other things that could cause these extrinsic effects or even the geometry of how you're measuring. And uh, Oscar actually has a, Vafek has a paper showing how you know you can get and show you one how this this two-fold anisotropy can emerge uh, uh, if you have strain and how it can even change if you change the the, the doping or the or the concentration level or just change the the the, the electronic structure. So every every this these are good directions, but there is more work to be done until it can be declared an emetic superconductor. And finally, the other material that I wanted to bring to your attention is tantalum disulfide. This is a 4-HB, is a, is, a, is a kind of a crystal. So tantalum disulfide is a dichalcogenide. It has, uh, you know, most of the time we're used to these two uh, kinds of polymorphs, the T and the H. But there is this bulk material that is alternating of T and H. H on its own is superconductor. T on its own is believed to be a, a MOT insulator on the verge of being a spin liquid. <coughs> Excuse me. And then if you just put them together in this bulk compound, this was done recently, this is by the group of Amit Knigo, you see that uh, below TC there is a clear mu SR uh, a signal of time, potential time reverse symmetry breaking. And this is a more recent data showing that at even um, um, near TC, you also see this two-fold oscillation. So this is still uh, uh, under debate what this all means, okay? But these are all evidence, if of anything, that you have likely multi-component superconductivity in the systems. Um, as I mentioned, all of these you need to, the main difficulties is the, are these effects extrinsic, intrinsic. For example, as I mentioned, in the actual strain, can give rise to two-fold anisotropy. So how do you distinguish that from intrinsic, from intrinsic? There are ways of doing that. There are strategies to do that, but it needs to be done carefully, as it's for people have been doing. Same for 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 uh, uh, Cairo. Uh, is this is this an effect? Is this a bulk? Uh, 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 are this, is the sample becoming magnetic, or is this just uh, maybe uh, filamentary, or or just a very small volume fraction? Okay. There's a, uh, one thing that puzzles me a lot is all these experiments, especially resistivity, why would you see just two-fold anisotropy? If you break the uh, three-fold rotational symmetry, you should see three domains. And then when you do a, a, a measurement, you should see this completely average out. You shouldn't see the two-fold anisotropy if you have domains. So, but why would you have in a big sample just a single domain? That's, that's a, a big question. Same for Cairo, for example. And, um, and the other question is, is this multi-band superconduct, is this multi-component superconductivity? For uh, of what I told you, that you have uh, two, uh, two gaps that are enforced by symmetry to be degenerate, or is this coincidental you have two different gaps that for some reason are 
closing energy, okay? For that part is where the formalism I was discussing with you can be helpful. Uh, remember what I mentioned that uh, if you have a no abelian point group, that's the only case where you can have a multi component superconducting state enforced by symmetry. And cubic has more multi dimensional wraps than hexagonal, than tetragonal. So this is where you could try to look for these things, right? This is my very personal biased, probably wrong uh, classification of what I call if, 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 if this uh, uh, behavior here, this multi component is coming from symmetry or from uh, accidental degeneracy. I can say for sure that the Renan Telluride has to be accidental because, the, as I mentioned yesterday, this is a neutronic point group, which does not, is a billion and done, so it doesn't have multi dimensional representation. So any two gaps that coincide must be accidentally. Now, this is not a typo. What, how do you want to think of twisted cuprate? Actually, I think this is a very interesting. It depends on, on your point of view, I think. Um, you can say, oh, it's accidental because I took a D-wave superconductor, I rotated it by 45 degrees, so I made, I made it just two different gaps. I forced it to be uh, degenerate. But I like to think of this as that, and again, I, I think Marcel is going to tell you more about this, that when you twist them, you actually create an artificial group that is actually not crystallographic, so this is actually a quasi-crystal, for those that like group theory, this is D4D, which is not a crystallographic group. And in this quasi-crystalline group, these two gaps are actually belong to the same irreducible representation. So you see, you have this uh, freedom here. Okay? Any questions? Before I go back to calculations, yes? Well, so, so some materials will have D positive and others negative. That's the way that you can think. Now, why some materials have D positive and D negative? That will depend on the, uh, on the microscopic modeling. And that's a question that is, that really depends on, on what are the interactions and, and, and what's happening to your system. I can, from my description, G is a parameter. So different materials have different Gs, positive or negative. How about the when the the topic of knowledge is that um, the model that we looked at is not a model. Can that be a model for pneumatic points that work in the field? But at the same higher order at the same time. It can uh, under some circumstances. Um, my analysis is as close to TC. There is a possibility that below, at lower temperatures, well below Tc, there is a different symmetry. This is dangerous to do with Ginzburg-Landau because Ginzburg-Landau is close to Tc, but there are situations we know where uh, if you do a calculation at t equals zero, it wants one ground state near Tc, it wants a different state, and you expect there is a change in the middle. Uh, I mean, <coughs> can I ask, a, could I get a, sorry, a, a small cup of water, please, sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. The nature of the transition two by C um, is either first order or GCCC, which is the second order. Um, I'll get to this point a little bit more. It's a little more complicated than that, but generically, uh, G, um, it would be a first order transition at zero temperature because you just have two different states. Now, uh, a deconfined, thank you so much. A deconfined computical point would be a theory that is beyond what I'm just telling you from Ginsburg Landau. But we'll go back to that point. I, I actually am not sure that you would have a deconfined quantitative critical point. I think it's always going to be first order. Um, but we can talk more about that. Other questions? Okay, so this is all mean field. Let's go beyond mean field and see what we learn, okay? So here's what I want to tell you. I had this phase diagram, right? 
G over U. And uh, as someone asked yesterday, there's some bounds here so that the free energy doesn't is bounded. And I'm not going to draw the bounds here, but there are bounds. So we have here pneumatic, and my delta is uh, cosine sine. And again, remember that this alpha is fixed to some values. Cairo, where delta is proportional to one plus or minus i. But remember, there is a different symmetry broken in each phase, right? Here, this is uh, time reversal symmetry breaking, and this is rotational symmetry breaking, right? And I, how do I capture this additional symmetry? Remember that I drew those, uh, I wrote down those uh, additional order parameters I call psi three and psi two and psi one. Let me just write them again. So let's first write what I call psi two, which was I delta one star delta two minus delta two star delta one, which if you remember was just sine, oops, sorry. Which was just delta square sine beta sine two alpha. And just so we're all on the same page, my parametrization was that delta bar is delta e to the i theta, do this, cosine alpha e to the i beta sine alpha, okay? So beta is a relative phase, alpha is a relative amplitude. Okay, good. And then I said that, right, if, if I fix alpha to be pi over four, which is the case of the Cairo, right, then this psi two is just delta squared times sine beta. And that can be either plus or minus one, right? So plus delta square or minus delta square, okay? Uh, everybody remember this notation? Should I go back a little bit? Okay, sounds good. So. I think it's very clear that if I calculate this Psi 2 in the chiral phase, right, so let's do this in the chiral phase, right, Psi 2 is going to be um, just delta square, plus or minus 1, right? Because I can just substitute delta 1 is 1, or just delta times 1, delta 2 is i, right? So I, I just get exactly this, this quantity here, right? If I calculate for the pneumatic phase, Right, if I substitute this guy here, cosine alpha, sine alpha, it's just real. So you see that this has to be zero and it is zero, okay? So the pneumatic phase is psi two is zero. Which makes sense, psi two, as I mentioned, is nothing but an angular momentum along the z axis. So it has to be zero if I don't break time reversal, it has to be non-zero if I break time reversal, okay? Now, if you remember, I also defined that other quantity which I call psi three psi one, which was delta one square, oops, minus delta two square, delta one delta two star plus so the two component object. And again, you can do the same exercise, right? If I substitute here the Cairo solution, I'm gonna get this psi three psi one is zero. Right, because delta one is equal to delta two in magnitude and the relative phase is pi over two. If I do for the pneumatic, I'm gonna get that this here, again, is just cosine and sine, so you get, oops, delta square cosine to alpha sine to alpha, okay? Which is non-zero. So if I go back to my phase diagram, what I'm trying to say is that I really have, here I also have psi two different than zero, and here I have psi one, psi three different than zero, okay? Notice that psi one, psi three, these psi's, they don't really tell me if I have superconducting order. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but let me explain why. Psi only depends on delta square, not on delta. So it doesn't know about gauge symmetry breaking, U1 symmetry breaking. But it knows about either time reversal or chiral, okay? So the question now that I wanna pose is something that Boris actually said, um, explaining his talk from a different perspective, but it is the same. 
can I have a situation where this psi is different than zero, but delta is zero? Okay. That's a question I want to answer. And again, this is a this is a very close analogy. It's the same idea that Boris said. I'm going to focus on something at finite temperatures instead of zero temperatures. But it's the same idea of having uh, psi different than zero and delta equals to zero. Now, psi itself depends on delta squared. So I can obviously have this. This is always true, right? This, this can always be true. Actually, this is exactly what you call superconducting fluctuations, right? This is precisely the superconducting fluctuation. But it doesn't break any symmetries. My psi 1, psi 2 is a particular combination of delta squared that breaks the symmetry. Okay? Uh, any questions so far? So you already start seeing that this is related to fluctuations. <coughs> and, and to capture that, I can't do it in field. I have to go beyond that. Let's do this a little bit more. Yes? Oh, it's just expectation value. Like, I mean, if I think I minimize the free energy. So this expectation value is just the, the expectation value at the minimum of the free energy, something like that. But to, to appreciate this a little bit more, uh, it's very interesting to notice that, and I'm gonna go here on the side a little bit, that these psi's are just examples of something more general, which are bilinear. Or composite order parameters. What do I mean by that? I have the order parameter delta, right, which is delta 1, delta 2. That's what I'm going to call the primary order parameter. But I can define generically a bilinear, which I'm going to call psi mu, which is just going to be delta i, I'm going to sum over ij, delta i, a Pauli matrix tau mu ij delta j. Or if you want delta uh, star, sorry, delta dagger tau mu delta, okay? This object, I have four of them because I have four poly matrices, classifies all the possible bilinears, meaning all the composites that come from this square of this order parameter, okay? And now you see why I call the things psi 2, psi 1, psi 3, because let's just see what they are, right? So psi 0, that's very easy, right? I just get delta 1 square plus delta 2 square, right? I'm going to skip, I'm going to go 2 first, so 2 is, is going to be i tau 1 star tau 2 minus tau 2 star tau 1, tau delta 1, there's a minus here, and 1 is of, uh, is of course delta 1 star delta 2 plus delta 2 star delta 1. Again, I'm just using here tau x, tau y, tau z. Okay? And psi 3 is delta 1 square minus delta 2 square. Right? And now you see why I call them what they I did, because they are they're examples of these bilinears. And you can classify the symmetries of these bilinears, right? So psi zero really doesn't do anything. It doesn't break any symmetries. This is just superconducting fluctuations, okay? And they have to be present at any temperature. This guy, as I mentioned, breaks time reversal. So this is actually transforms as a ferromagnetic moment, okay? So as ferromagnetism. And it's time reversal symmetry breaking, okay? So if it is known zero, it means that I have to break that symmetry. And these two guys here together transform as pneumatic, which break rotational symmetry, right? Okay? So, yes? Yes, orbital ferromagnetism, yeah. You don't need to invoke any spins or anything. Absolutely. Uh, so you see, I can cons so if you have a one component order parameter, you only have psi zero. But now, because I have a multi component, I open three more, and all these options break an additional symmetry. Okay. 
So, uh, the, so going back to the question that I asked, and again, I'm gonna go again to the side just to make this point, this, what I'm describing to you is, a, is something that is a concept of vestigial order, okay? So vestigial order means that, the, that a bilinear, and I'm gonna do here very generically, right? Delta dagger, tau delta is different than zero, while delta equals to zero. Okay, why is it called vestigial order? Well, think about this. Uh, let's, let's do a phase diagram as function of temperature, okay? And I'm gonna put here two three different regimes. This regime here, both delta tau delta is zero and delta equals to zero. That's just the disordered phase, okay? Then I go to the uh, ordered phase, and now I know that both have to be non-zero, right? Uh, that's what we just did now, right? This is non-zero and this is zero, right? This is non-zero as well, right? This is superconducting. It could be chiral or pneumatic. This is the disorder, okay? What I'm asking is, is there a phase in between where the bilinear, I think you, you can see that, right? It's not too, the bilinear is non-zero, but the order parameter itself is zero, okay? And this here would be the vestigial phase, okay? Why do I call it vestigial? Does anyone, I didn't call it that, but I like the name. Yes, Boris. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. And, and the context here, and that's the important part, why do we call it vestigial in this scenario, right? And for example, in the case of the Boris was saying, maybe the word vestigial is not appropriate, as he's saying, because here, there's a sequence of transitions, right? This, this guy here breaks, the second one means that I break gauge symmetry, I fix the phase of the superconductor. This here means that I either, let's say I broke time reversal, right? That's psi two. So you see I broke two symmetries, U1 symmetry and a Z2 and I Z symmetry related to time reversal symmetry. Then I wanna go to the disorder phase where both symmetries are restored but I do that first by going through a vestigial phase where I restore one of the symmetries, in this case, the gauge symmetry, but I still have that Z2 symmetry broken. That's the idea of vestigial, meaning I restore some of the symmetries broken by my ground state, but not all of them. So it's a vestige of what you had earlier, meaning you have some information of the symmetries you broke at lower temperatures, okay? So, uh, this is nothing but a generalization of the idea of pneumatic, uh, in liquid crystals, right? Liquid crystal, the name says, is liquid and crystal, because you restore, like a liquid crystal, a pneumatic liquid crystal, you restore translational symmetry, but not the rotational symmetry when you go from the crystal to the liquid phase. So you see two symmetries. This doesn't happen in water, right? Water, you also in the solid state, you also break translational and rotational. There is if you, if you heat up water, right, you go to a liquid phase. You don't have a phase in between where you only have rotation or not. You need a liquid crystal for that. So the situation here is, is, is analogous. I have I break two symmetries, and then can I restore one of them only and keep the other one broken? Is it clear? Yes. No, it's, uh, it's not because if delta is non-zero, then delta square has to be non zero as well. Yes? But? Very good. Excellent question. 
Uh, from a symmetry perspective, yes, because um, if I classify the anomalous hull, uh, the, the, the hull vector, right, the, uh, if it has the same transformation properties for side two. So that would still have an anomalous, that would have an anomalous hull, uh, but it would not be a superconductor, obviously. So you're right. Okay. Right. How would I know I just don't have something like the PMD where it's showing me this is particular value, this is lacking, and it's kind of a normal hole? Or is it just a matter of graphing, you know, with HDF? Right. So I, I think your question is how do I distinguish that phase, a vestigial phase, from just a uh, anomalous hole effect coming from spin polarized uh, uh, state, for example, just fer or ferromagnetism, let's even simplify that. Absolutely. From a symmetry perspective, they're, they're identical. And that's the point maybe that Boris was also making that it all depends on, on the mechanism to some extent, right? Uh, this is an, a mechanism by which you can get a, a, a phase. It doesn't really, if, you, if there are no superconducting fluctuations or anything like that, this mechanism is irrelevant, right? So it's more of a mechanism than, than a description. So uh, the other way of thinking about that, so how do I know, for example, uh, I'll have to step back and go to the iron-based superconductors where how do I know that, so there there is a nematic phase that is a vestigial of the a different phase called stripe phase. How do I know that? Because I can measure the fluctuations of the nematic phase, which is the shear modulus, and I can measure the fluctuations of the magnetic phase via one over T1 T in NMR, and I can show that they beautifully scale with each other, showing that they're not independent. So that's what you need to, to prove that it's really vestigial, is that you need to show that the fluctuations of one are essentially just uh, a consequence of the fluctuations of the other phase. So you're essentially looking for something like diamagnetism? Exactly. So, and that's, a, okay, excellent point, because... Diamagnetism. Huh? Diamagnetism, too. So, you saw these experiments where, where, where it showed this, uh, 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 um, maybe I can go back here. I'm, co I'm already uh, thinking, I'm not gonna get to the end of my lecture, but that's okay, I think this is important. Um, if you look at this data here, for example, okay, and I don't think this is a vestigial phase, so it's, it's but, but I just wanna make the case, right? So, you see, you see the two-fold oscillations, okay, this is in a TMD, but you see they only appear in a regime, and I don't have a plot here of the resistivity, but this regime here, these temperatures where you see these two-fold oscillations, is precisely where the resistivity is starting to go down. That's the fluctuation regime of the superconductivity. If I go above it, I don't see it, right? That gives me a hint that this could be, it turns out that I don't think that's the case here, but yes, so you need that. So uh, the reason I think it's not that is because um, the superconducting state itself does not seem to be breaking any symmetries. Uh, there's no reason that, I mean, it's just, we know that it should be S wave. I think what happens here, and I mean, okay, disclaimer, I'm a co-author of this first paper. So <laughs> Sorry. So my, my, my interpretation of this is the following. Um, Naomi selenide is an S wave superconductor, bulk. But when you go to the monolayer, because of this uh, ising spin orbit coupling, you start favoring also a P wave, or a triplet, let me call. And what I think is happening here is nothing but that you are, because of the field that you are applying, combined with ising spin orbit coupling, you're mixing singlet and triplet, that's why you get that. It does, it requires that both superconducting st stabilities are the closing energy, so you, that's, that's how we interpret this data. Other people have different interpretations. Any other questions? Yes. So as the symmetry, oops, oh, too much, sorry. Wait, ah, what I'm doing? I don't know, sorry. Ah, okay. We don't, actually, a symmetry does not even tell me if this phase happened because Another option is that I just have a first order transition where both happen. Symmetry, so from a symmetry point of view, and that's the point I was gonna tell now, is that I need to do a calculation. 
I need to have to, to see whether this is going to happen or not. I could just have a first order transition between two. There, there, are several, there are two options. Either the transitions are simultaneous, in which case they have to be first order because, because of the different symmetries, or they're split. If they're split, there's a vestigial phase. Okay? And if, uh, if they're split and there's a vestigial phase, they both can be first order, both second order, one second and the other first. There's nothing that tells me one way or another. Okay? What I know for sure is that if I have a second order vestigial transition, I must have a split superconducting transition. Okay? Um, because I'm not gonna probably have time to go over everything, I just want to show that there is, uh, what, is, the, what, I, what, is the, what are the materials where you have the best e evidence for vestigial phase? So I just put here the one that uh, uh, Boris said yesterday, it's a different mechanism because there, there's no symmetry imposed degeneracy of, of, of gaps, okay? But uh, this is the best candidate, I would say, for vestigial superconducting phase. There are other vestigial phases that are not superconducting, but like the iron-based superconductors. But this, the bismuth selenide is a topological insulator, you dope it, becomes a superconductor. And um, if you're interested, I can tell you more about the data, but it's very clear, and that goes back, I guess, to the point that uh, Oscar and Aries were making. Uh, you measure the diamagnetism, okay? And the susceptibility. And you see, in the superconducting state, it's diamagnetic. But here, okay, this is the regime of fluctuations. And what you see in the regime of fluctuations, okay, is that it's different if you measure along XX or, or, or YY. Okay, here. So that's the nematic susceptibility. That's the, the vestigial nematicity. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's a very good, I think, experiment. I put twisted bilegraphene because it could be, maybe, I have hopes, you know, when I sleep at night, it's like, oh, you know, today was terrible, but maybe there's vestigial nematicity in this, okay? Uh, okay, no, uh, it's not true. I mean, I do think it is, it could be <laughs> vestigial nematicity. But w why I say that? Because if this is indeed a nematic superconductor, and this is, again, very beautiful data from Pablo's group, is that you see there's this kind of envelope of a, uh, I know it's small, I know, I know all of this, but it does seem there's something following the DOM with a, with a resistivity and isotropy. But there are several issues here and I'm not gonna go into those. More questions, yes. Uh, not according, Maybe there's a regime where, wh when if you're very close to the chiral to the nematic transition, but I th would think it's very hard because once you, y once you fix the, the vestigial phase, the, by the composite order orders, um, then you're essentially biasing your system to go in that direction. So I would be surprised if that happened. Yes? Is there a connection between the vestigial phase and the pseudo gaps? No. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Let me just leave it there. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. Uh, here's how it could happen, but hasn't been shown. That's why I'm a bit reluctant. If you have a theory where superconductive fluctuations give rise to a pseudo gap, okay, then yes, because once you go to the vestigial phase, you actually, there's a feedback effect of the vestigial phase on the superconductive fluctuation. So let me just draw it here, I think it'll be easy. So what I'm trying to say is that if I, if I calculate superconducting susceptibility, I'm gonna do the inverse as function of temperature, right? You would expect it to diverge, I don't know, at Tc, right? If you have in the middle here vestigial phase, T vestigial, then what's gonna actually happen is that this guy is gonna come here and then there's gonna be a change of slope here, something like that, okay? This is observed in a different vestigial phase in this iron-based superconductor and other ones. So you see the vestigial phase enhances superconducting fluctuations, it's a feedback effect, okay? And if you have a theory where large superconducting fluctuations cause a pseudo gap, then this could be a, uh, an input if you wish and then you may, may get that. It doesn't need to be coincidental, 
and actually would not be a phase transition because it'd be a crossover for the pseudo gap because there must be a critical right value. But in this regard, maybe. I'm not aware of a microscopic theory, like starting from <laughs> really zero, where you associate superconducting fluctuations with pseudo gap. Now, there is, of course, in 2D, things could be special and different, absolutely. Any other questions? Yes. Excellent. That's exactly the next part of my lecture. How do I see that beautiful effect? So, as I said, if you do mean field, you don't get it. They happen at the same temperature. To which include fluctuations. And now you choose. There are many ways of doing fluctuations, right? You could do RG, randomization group. You could do variational. But what I'm going to quickly, I'm not going to be able to do it, but I'm just going to outline is what's called large N. Okay? It's just, I think, a bit more intuitive. Or you can do Monte Carlo. That actually has been done as well. Um, I've done the three of them, and there's a regime where they all agree on the results, some they don't, so because none of the methods are uh, you know, exact, they're always approximate, so, but it's still an interesting problem. Okay, so what do I do? I need to include fluctuations. So I can't really think in terms of the free energy. I have to think in terms, I need to include the fluctuations of the order, and then usually the, 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 the best way to think is in terms of the action, which is S, and you can loosely think of S as just the free energy divided by temperature, okay? But again, it's just loosely speaking, all I'm saying is that the, the, the action has uh, time fluctuations, spatial fluctuations, and everything, okay? So it's very similar, but now you know I have an integral to c account for the fluctuations. So usually we write like this, I have uh, something like A, which is the same A as before, but now I have Q squared, which is the gradient. These are spatial fluctuations. And I must have some function of omega as well. Omega are uh, temporal fluctuations. I'm doing mass to body. And then you have this is the same term. Okay. Uh, so this here, of course, is what we would call the inverse no interacting susceptibility. Uh, uh, a Q here, yeah, Q here represents, I'm going to do this. So Q here represents both momentum and uh, frequency, Matsubata frequency. And then I have the, uh, the additional terms that I already had before, right? So I have u over 4, integral of x. Now x, again, uh, represents both uh, time, imaginary time and, and space, and this one here. Okay, and just for notation, this means really T sum over Matsubata frequencies integral ddq over 2 pi over d, okay? And integral over x really means integral from 0 to 1 over temperature of imaginary time integral over ddr, okay? But we're not going to be using much of that. So I should have said one thing before, which I forgot. Sorry, let's go back before I do this calculation. Um, go back to the free energy. Uh, I just want to look at this term here. L let me just write the free energy, sorry. There's one very important identity, which is going to shed some light on these things. Okay, plus G over 4. Delta one, delta square. Oops. Delta one star, delta two minus delta two star, delta one square. Okay. So what I want you to notice is the following. What is this term in the Ginzburg-Landau? This is nothing but that psi naught square, right? It's clear, right? And this is also nothing but the Psi 2 square. Right? Psi 2 was just, remember, I. Okay? So you understand now why G negative gives me 
gives me a, a chiral, right? Because if I think in terms of, of this, by this is a composite order, right? So the quartic term is a quadratic term for the composite. And this coefficient g, if it's negative, means that I want to order that. Is it clear? So you already see that connection. Now there's something really nice, which is to say, well, but what about psi 1 and psi 3, right? Let's just uh, write this for one second, right? Psi 2 is delta 1 star delta 2 minus delta, oops, delta 2 star delta 1, which was uh, sine beta sine 2 alpha, right? And times delta squared, sorry. And psi 1, psi 3 is uh, cosine alpha, sine alpha, cosine beta, delta squared, okay? Uh, which is the same again as delta 1 squared minus delta 2 squared, delta 1, delta 2 star plus delta 1 star, delta 2, okay? Now, there's a very interesting identity. Let's do psi 2 squared. What is psi 2 squared? Well, it's sine squared beta, sine squared to alpha, delta squared, delta 4, right? What is psi 1 squared plus psi 3 squared? Well, let's see. I'm going to get cosine squared alpha plus sine squared alpha, 2 alpha, um, Sine square beta. Sorry, there's a two here missing. It's going to be important. Square beta, delta four, right? But look at this. I can just go come here, and well, this is nothing but one minus sine square of beta, right? So this guy here becomes. I can also write psi 1 squared plus psi 3 squared as cosine squared plus sine squared gives me 1 minus sine squared beta cosine squared beta. Okay? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sine squared to alpha cosine squared beta. Yeah. Sine squared. Delta fourth, right? Well, but this is nothing but psi naught square, right? Delta fourth minus psi two square, right? So you found this identity, psi one square plus psi three square plus psi two square is psi naught square, okay? Which means that I could come here in my free energy, right? And I could also have written, so let's just go back for one second. I'm, I wrote a over 2 delta square plus u over 4 delta fourth minus plus g over 4 delta fourth. Well, I actually can even simplify this a little bit. Let's just do psi naught square, and here was psi 2 square. So this one here I can replace by psi 1 square plus psi 3 square, or minus this, plus psi naught square. So I can also write the free energy equally as a over 2 delta square plus u over 4. I can uh, absorb this g here, so it becomes u plus g over 4 psi naught square. Now it becomes minus g over 4 psi 1 square plus psi 3 square. So you see? I got a minus sign there. It makes a lot of sense now because if this g is positive, then this acts as a negative mass to my other composite, which is then a massive, right? This is nothing but, uh, this identity is an example of something more general called a Pierce identity, okay? So you can prove that this is delta i star tau mi delta j, i j, mu equals one, two, and three, is equal to delta i star tau naught delta j sum over ij. This is an example. Oops, I don't need to sum over ij. It's implicit. So this is an example of, um, and this happens 
if you have a higher order composite and as well, okay? All right, so um, I have a tough choice right now because I have 10 minutes and I still have probably another half an hour of material. So I'm just gonna outline some of how, how would you do this large N, okay? How would you do this large N? So the idea is the following. The idea is to use something called the hubbard sutonovit transformation. Oh, uh, here we go. It went to speak again. Transformation. Okay. And the idea is that you can write down, so, wow, okay. I think in terms of the, of the partition function in terms of, so it's a functional integral, a partition function in terms of this delta, okay? E to the minus action, okay? And it is the following. I know how to do Gaussian functional integrals. I don't know how to do anything else. So the quartic terms are the problem, but you can write down the quartic terms in the, by introducing auxiliary fields in this way. So let me start with uh, let's take this this uh, this term here for example. Okay, I can write down e to the there's a minus here because of the minus action, delta one delta. Well, actually, let me do. Yeah. Minus delta two delta one star delta two, integral square. You can write this, and this is the Hapsonovich transformation in terms of some auxiliary fields which you can call Psi 2, okay? E to the uh, minus uh, or plus here Psi 2 square over 4G integral minus, no, let me just, let me do this. Integral of Psi two square over four G minus psi two over two delta one delta two star minus delta one star delta two. You have to be careful with the factors of I. I'm not gonna worry too much about it here. There should be an I here. But you can show this is just a Gaussian integral, okay? Huh? Here G is positive. Oh, negative, I'm uh, positive, uh, blah, blah, blah. wait. G has to be negative here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so let me just check one thing. I did this for the other one, I just don't wanna get confused myself even more. Yeah, G is negative here, okay. Um, so this, you can do that for all the quartic terms and as, you can, as I explained before, right, all quartic terms, and again, I'm just gonna summarize what it is here because I'm really not gonna have time. All quartic terms are of the form of that psi mu square, right? And essentially, I can always write, therefore, uh, a quartic term which is delta uh, bar tau mu delta square. I can always via the Herbstotonovich decompose it into a psi mu delta bar tau mu delta over two minus psi mu square over whatever four uh, and the coupling which I'm gonna call G. So this is how you get this replacement in the action by doing, by introducing these auxiliary fields, okay? You can do that for all the composites and then you're gonna get an action and again I'm just going to It's unfortunately, I'll be happy to discuss more with you later if you're interested in the details or point you to references where we do that. But you're gonna have something like this, and now the action depends on delta and on psi. But now it's quadratic in delta. And then you can integrate out delta, and you're gonna get then essentially uh, an, in, uh, an effective action just in terms of the auxiliary field. Okay, this is exact, and this effective action usually is gonna be something of this form. It's going to have a trace of a log of 
the inverse susceptibility of the superconducting state. That's the term that you get for integrating other factors of half and n that I'm not putting here, okay? Uh, for integrating out the superconducting fluctuations plus the minus the psi square plus psi square over 4g and, 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 and so on, okay? And this chi minus here is the renormalized chi that has all this psi. So it's a self-consistent problem. This is exact. The large n consists of taking the saddle point as exact, as, as the solution. Why it's called large n is because if you pretend that this delta has n components, there's going to be a factor of n in front here. And you know from uh, that in the limit where n goes to infinity, the saddle point is an exact solution of that. And so this is one way, again, I'm just, uh, I'm just sketching what it is. And, uh, and that's it. Then you can now answer your, the question that was asked. You can actually show whether this scenario happens or not. Okay? And if you do this calculation for this problem, what you find, let me show you the result. That, let me see it here. If, you, if you write, if in a dimension 2 plus epsilon, Two is tricky because in two you cannot have long grain superconducting order, right? Because of uh, of uh, um, uh, Wagner's theorem, which you actually get for free in this approach. That's what is nice. Just gonna go back here. You find out that um, as long as g over u is smaller than one minus epsilon, then you get split vestigial space. Okay. That's the result of this calculation, which I was going to show you, but we're definitely not going to have time. Yes? Huh? You do. It's just depending on the regime where you find it. Or you can always find it. Yeah. Um, to finish, I just wanted to say another very important thing, which uh, is uh, something that we did recently with Liang Fu, was that to notice something, uh, the following thing, right? Uh, I introduced the bilinears, right, psi mu, which were d star i tau mu i j delta j, right? Why, why not consider also these bilinears? Delta no, i, tau i, j, mu, delta j, okay? You see there's no star here. This means these objects have twice the phase of the superconductor, so all these objects are actually corresponds to a charge for E order, okay? Uh, what they mean is that if, if, if this guy is non-zero, it means that I have a, supercon a superconducting state, but the object is not a pair of electrons, but a quartet of electrons. Okay? And it turns out there's a very nice identity, which I'm not going to prove to you, but I'm just going to say that it, the psi 1 square plus psi 3 square is actually equal to phi naught prime square plus phi naught double prime. Prime and double prime just mean imaginary and real because this is complex here, right? There's this identity here for the hexagonal case, which means that, in fact, there is a degeneracy between a vestigial nematic order and a vestigial charge for E order. They're degenerate in the hexagonal lattice, okay? Just to tell, uh, and so we proposed that you can, if you have a, a, a nematic superconductor in a hexagonal lattice, you may be able to realize, at least locally, charge for your order, okay? Just to bre very briefly tell you what is charge for your order, this is the last joke I'm gonna make. It's a pair of pairs, no? Okay. Um, so it's a quartet, there's a long history of quarteting, Boris also mentioned some of it. Um, it one of the signatures is that uh, Aries also worked on this field, so if you have questions about charge for e this afternoon, uh, you can ask to Professor Fernandez, uh, but he will, he will answer, right? Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the flux quantization is half a flux because the charge is 4E. And there's a lot that we don't know about the charge for a super state. 
it's, uh, the, the, the general idea is that most likely it's a gapless state, but it has uh, infinite uh, convectivity. Uh, so anyway, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I just wanted to mention that um, in this formalism here of vestigial phases, you get nematic and, 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 and chiral, vestigial nematic, vestigial chiral, right? But you can also now get vestigial charge for your orders. Uh, the zero here is an S wave charge for E. If you use here one or three, it's a D wave charge for E. And you open a, a whole new box of uh, possibilities to get completely different uh, uh, states that you wouldn't get from the ground state. Uh, I'll leave it there. I know this last part was rushed, but I think it's good that we discuss some of the physics. If you want to know more details, just feel free to email me or to ask Aries during the discussion this afternoon. Thank you.